Hello everyone and welcome back to our discussion on realism. Today we're going to begin our reading of the text for this portion of the unit, How Much Land Does a Man Need? by Leo Tolstoy. Before we dive in though, it's really important that we get into the proper headspace for this text, meaning that we understand what type of literature it is, what its basic premise is, and how we intend to interact and engage with the text. So the first thing that we need to understand about how much land does a man need is that is a short story. So we're looking at something that is not as long as a novel, nor as long as a novella would be, but something shorter that has a concise and tight purpose in relaying the theme. Another thing in particular about this short story that we need to be aware of is that Leo Tolstoy writes this after his spiritual transformation. So you'll remember from our video from last week that he undergoes this existential crisis in which he realizes that he has everything a man could possibly want, but he's still not satisfied with life. He wants something more. And this is definitely going to be related to what we see and even hints of it are already given in the title of the short story itself. How much land does a man need? So this concept of, is it ever really enough to be satisfied? Can I placate my inner needs with material goods? And this is where we come to the connect to your life question. And I thought this was a really important question to discuss, to really get the engine moving in terms of our thought process on this text in particular and making sure that we're able to connect more readily with it. Because that's one of the main things in, in realism that's so easy to do is to connect to the text because it portrays life as it actually is. So whereas it was harder to connect with Dante's Inferno, for example, because it is more of a fantastic piece in terms of its super natural vibes, in terms of its uh, sort of grandiose display and its intense literary features. When we come to this text as realist literature, its point is to be approachable. So with that being said, let's read the question together. Connect to your life. If only I had. Sound familiar? Name one thing you really want and one thing you absolutely need. What do you think is the difference between these two? How might your life change if you get what you wanted? So thinking about on a personal level, think about something that you really, really want. Something that you could live without, obviously, right? Because that's what a want is. Something you don't necessarily must have to survive, but something that you would like to enjoy your life better. And then think about something you absolutely need. Something that you cannot live without. It's a physical impossibility, right? So for example, I might really want a million dollars, right? Who among us, right, wouldn't really want that? But what is something I absolutely need, right? I could be surrounded in a room full of dollar bills, but if I don't have access to water, for example, if I I don't have that need, then I'm going to be in really big trouble. So I, in this instance, would have gotten what I wanted, But without having what I need, I'm in trouble. So this is what we need to think about when we come to approaching this story. Building background then. So one of the important things we need to understand is that Tolstoy in writing his literature very much brought in his own world experiences. That's something that we see is central in realism. These authors will write from their own personal experience. And Tolstoy was a social reformer, meaning he looked at these social issues around him and saw how he as a figure could change the world to make it better. So one of the things that he really drove home about was supporting the freeing of serfs, uh, peasants, Russian peasants in particular, who would have essentially been treated as slaves or property by the landowners whom they worked for. So although Tolstoy is successful, right, in bringing about freedom for, for some of these serfs, while some of that population, right, in their freedom gains wealth and prosperity, a great number of them remain poor. But this again, goes to show Tolstoy's affection for them. He has a deep love um, for the 
what he viewed, right, as humble workers, as these humble serfs, and he even worked alongside of them. And in this process of working side by side with them on the fields, he made this discovery that it wasn't this need for material possessions that would satisfy man, right, but the key to improving the life of these serfs, right, was a moral issue, not an economic one. And so on two levels, we're going to be engaging with this story, this idea that there's going to be a primary difference between what someone wants and what someone needs. And that at the very heart of causing social change is going to be a change that is morally based, not economically based. So it's not enough to bring someone out of poverty, right, if I don't look at the system that brought them there in the first place. As we begin to read then in the next coming slides, the two things we're going to be focusing on is one, the theme in fiction. So remember, a theme is simply defined as the moral lesson that the author is trying to relay to the reader, and that this theme is usually going to be stated indirectly, meaning it's going to be given through hints throughout the story. But my job as the reader is to engage with the text and really try to identify that theme on my own. And again, that's where we're going to be led to drawing conclusions. So the idea of drawing conclusions is I read something and in the end of my reading, I make this summary, right? Or I make, better yet, right, this central idea that I can conclude from my reading. And these conclusions are going to help to determine the theme. So the first of these conclusions we're going to be doing in our readings today is to be drawing conclusions about our central character. So based on my reading, what do I learn about their character? Without further ado, let's go ahead then and dive into reading the first two sections of how much land does a man need? And you can follow along on pages 959 to 961 of your literature textbook. An elder sister came to visit her younger sister in the country. The elder was married to a tradesman in town, the younger to a peasant in the village. As the sisters sat over their tea talking, the elder began to boast of the advantages of town life, saying how comfortably they lived there, how well they dressed, what fine clothes her children wore, what good things they ate and drank, and how she went to the theater, promenades and entertainments. The younger sister was piqued, and in turn disparaged the life of a tradesman and stood up for that of a peasant. I would not change my way of life for yours, said she. We may live roughly, but at least we are free from anxiety. You live in better style than we do, but though you often earn more than you need, you are very likely to lose all you have. You know the proverb, loss and gain are brothers twain. It often happens that people who are wealthy one day are begging their bread the next. Our way is safer. Though a peasant's life is not a fat one, it is a long one. We shall never grow rich, but we shall always have enough to eat. The elder sister said sneeringly, Enough? Yes, if you like to share with the pigs and the calves. What do you know of elegance or manners? However much your good man may slave, you will die as you are living, on a dung heap, and your children the same. Well, what of that? replied the younger. Of course our work is rough and coarse, but, on the other hand, it is sure, and we need not bow to anyone, but to you, and your towns, are surrounded by temptations. Today all may be right, but tomorrow the evil one may tempt your husband with cards, wine, or women and all will go to ruin. Don't such things happen often enough? Pockham, the master of the house, was lying on the top of the stove, and he listened to the women's chatter. It is perfectly true, thought he. Busy as we are from children tilling Mother Earth, we peasants have no time to let any nonsense settle in our heads. Our only trouble is that we haven't land enough. If I had plenty of land, I shouldn't fear the devil himself. The women finished their tea, chatted a while about dress, and then cleared away the tea things and lay down to sleep. But the devil had been sitting behind the stove and had heard all that was said. 
he was pleased that the peasant's wife had led her husband into boasting and that he had said that if he had plenty of land he would not fear the devil himself all right thought the devil we will have a tussle i'll give you land enough and by means of that land i will get you into my power section two close to the village there lived a lady a small landowner who had an estate of about 300 acres she had always lived on good terms with the peasants until she engaged as her steward an old soldier who took to burdening the people with fines however careful pockham tried to be it happened again and again that now a horse of his got among the lady's oats now a cow strayed into her garden now his calves found their way into her meadows and he always had to pay a fine pockham paid up but grumbled and going home in a temper was rough with his family all through that summer pockham had much trouble because of this steward and he was even glad when winter came and the cattle had to be stabled though he grudged the doffer when they could no longer graze on the pasture land at least he was free from anxiety about them in the winter the news got about that the lady was going to sell her land and that the keeper of the inn on the high road was bargaining for it when the peasants heard this they were very much alarmed well thought they if the innkeeper gets the land he will worry us with fines worse than the lady's steward we all depend on that estate then the peasants tried to arrange for the commune to buy the whole estate so that it might be held by them all in common they met twice to discuss it but could not settle the matter the evil one sowed discord among them and they could not agree so they decided to buy the land individually each according to his means and the lady agreed to this plan as she had to the other presently pockham heard that a neighbor of his was buying fifty acres and that the lady had consented to accept one half in cash and to wait a year for the other pockham felt envious look at that thought he the land is all being sold and i shall get none of it so he spoke to his wife other people are buying said he and we must also buy twenty acres or so life is becoming impossible that steward is simply crushing us with his fines so they put their heads together and considered how they could manage to buy it they had one hundred roubles laid by they sold a colt and one half of their bees hired out one of their sons as a laborer and took his wages in advance borrowed the rest from a brother-in-law and so scraped together half the purchase money having done this pockham chose out a farm of forty acres some of it wooded and went to the lady to bargain for it they came to an agreement and he shook hands with her upon it and paid her deposit in advance then they went to town and signed the deeds he paying half the price down and undertaking to pay the remainder within two years so now pockham had land of his own he borrowed seed and sowed it on the land he had bought the harvest was a good one and within a year he had managed to pay off his debts both to the lady and to his brother-in-law so he became a landowner ploughing and sowing his own land making hay on his own land cutting his own trees and feeding his cattle on his own pasture when he went out to plough his fields or to look at his growing corn or at his grass meadows his heart would fill with joy the grass seemed to him unlike any that grew elsewhere formerly when he had passed by that land it had appeared the same as any other land but now it seemed quite different Now we're gonna go ahead and take these two sections, so part one and part two, and analyze them individually, looking both at what we can comprehend from the basic plot that's going on in the story so far, and then analyzing those deeper meanings and looking to see if we can draw those conclusions about our central character, Paco. So looking at part one, we see in terms of comprehension that the setting takes place in Russia and on farmland. And we're gonna make an estimated or uh, educated guess, right? That this story also takes place in the 1800s. And a lot of this has to do with the way in which the, the setting is describing the characters, right? So we clearly have 
this system of peasants not being able to have enough funds to own land of their own, right? And also this system in place of having landowners who have stewards to take care of the land for them and charge fines as needed, right? Something that would have been very much prevalent in the 1800s. And again, we can also safely say this because we're looking at Tolstoy's own background and his own history to see how this influences his writing, right? One of the key elements of realism. Then we're going to look at the characters. And in part one, we have three groups of characters that are going to be centrally important, right? And groups primarily talking about this first because I've grouped together the elder sister and the younger sister. Again, we're not given their names. So most likely for the fact that one, they're not central to the story. They kind of simply play a backdrop for others, but also their role as women in the story. So we do see that their argument, their initial bickering back and forth about which type of lifestyle is better, a lifestyle in the town or a lifestyle out in the country is best. And this initial argument is going to be what sets up the stage for the central conflict that we're going to continue to see unfold in this story. And that is clearly reflected in the character of Pockham. And this is the idea that it is impossible, right, to be content with what you have, and that this is going to create an internal conflict in our central character. And we see that from the beginning of Pockham's reflections, right? He's present during the argument that goes on, right? So he is said to be lying on the stove. So not thinking of stove as you and I would think of the stove in our kitchen, but as a way to keep warm, right? Because remember, rush in the winter is insanely cold. And as peasants, they wouldn't have had uh, a wealthier means of, of keeping heat in their home. Right? So Pakama is lying there seemingly asleep when he hears all of this going on. And he's going to make this later statement, right, that peasants, right, have a, a good thing in life in that they are not easily tricked, or they do not easily give in to sort of the the lesser things of the world. And this is going to be what, what sparks his conflict because he says the only thing that we're missing then is the fact that we don't have enough land. And this is where the devil comes in. And the devil is going to play a central figure as a character in the story. And a lot of you might be rightly asking, what is going on here? I thought that we were in realism, not romanticism. So I thought we were moving away from all of these supernatural and impossible things happening from stories, right? And this is true. But this is where we see Tolstoy sort of playing around with the genre a bit in that he brings information from classic folk tales. So tales that would have been very common in a culture and that also share a role in terms of theme with trying to relay a certain moral message. So this is where we are still in realism, right? Beyond a doubt. But we see that Tolstoy makes use of certain elements of folklore as well. And another interesting thing to note is that throughout the story, although the devil is going to be a character, he is also going to be unseen by, by those around him, right? Part of what adds to the irony that we're going to talk about later in the story. This first example being dramatic irony, because we understand that everything that is going to happen to Pockham, even what happens in part two, right? This access to land isn't necessarily because he's a good businessman or he's thrifty, good at making deals, but because the devil is working behind the scenes, pulling the strings, if you will, to make this happen. Now we're going to move away from comprehension and now towards analysis. And the first thing we're going to analyze together is looking at the key argument that takes place between these two sisters. And the two central things I want to talk about is the use of proverb and the use of metaphor in their disagreement. And a proverb is defined simply as a, a common saying, one that is revolving around giving wisdom or advice. So the proverb that's given here, loss and gain are brothers twain, is simply wisdom or advice, meaning that loss and gain go hand in hand, right? Just as quickly as you can gain something, you can lose it in the very next sentence. And this is something that the, the farm sister is trying to use to say, well, living life as a peasant isn't really so bad. 
And we see later that she makes use of a metaphor as well. Specifically, though a peasant's life is not a fat one, it is a long one. So thinking in terms of describing life in terms of these characteristics, right, where fat isn't meaning literally, right, that it's large or it's, it's overbearing in some sense, but that it's rich, that it's, it's full in the things that it needs. And also, on the other hand, it is a long one. So again, not taking this as a, a literal meaning, but meaning that it is one that is stable. And both of these things are going to be useful in not just painting peasants in a good light, right? We clearly see between these two sisters which of the two Tolstoy himself would have preferred, right? Because he paints the elder sister in this sort of evil, rotten light in the way that she speaks. But he gives this literary beauty in terms of language to the other, the peasant sister, right? But also not just in convincing us, but in convincing Pockham as well, because Pockham agrees with his wife, who then we understand to be the younger sister, but he doesn't stop there. And this is where we see the problem begin. And he says, yes, but wouldn't life be better if? And his if, his conditional, is if I had enough land, then I could truly be happy. And so again, looking at hints of a theme early on in the story, we already understand that a central issue that's going to be going on here is contentment. This idea from the very beginning that if Pockham was truly content with what he had, there would have been no opening for the devil in the first place. So again, hints, the theme is going to revolve around being content with what you've been given. And now we're going to move on to analysis for part two. So again, as a short story, you're going to see that we're going through this story rather quickly. That's one of the, the things that is nice about a short story, right? We, we get to the point of the story quicker. So the setting is still the same. We're still in Russia. We're still on a farm-like setting. But we see we have a couple of new characters that are introduced. The first being the landlady and the steward. So while the landlady is described as a kind woman, the steward is painted in this very negative light because he places these very heavy fines on the peasants for things that happen beyond their control, right? Particularly to Pockham, right? The cow ends up feeding in a pasture it shouldn't have or the animals end up breaking something, right? And at the news that the landlady is going to sell off her land and that the peasants then will be rid of the steward, the peasants, the other set of characters introduced here, seek to buy the land in order to keep it away from this other, this third character introduced, the innkeeper, who also seeks to buy the land. And it's heavily implied that this innkeeper is also not good news, that he is just as bad as the steward, if not worse. Right? So the peasants will seek to buy the land together. But we see from the very beginning, right now turning towards the analysis portion of part two, with the element of the folktale being introduced, that the devil is not one to leave well enough alone. And so he sees that the peasants are in initially, right, if they can succeed in buying the land together, then, then there is going to be no sense of achievement for Pockham or a sense of being able to grab for more than he has already. So we see that the text says that he sows discord among these people, meaning that he causes them to argue. And this is what opens the door in the rest of this section of the text for Pockham to be able to buy up this land. So again, the initial fulfilling of the devil's promise that he's going to give Pockham all the land that he desires so that he can trap him. And here's where we come to drawing conclusions. And we're going to draw conclusions about Pockham in this portion of the text. And one of the main things that you should see already is that he has this severe tendency to want more. Right? Even in the very beginning of the story, we see it, right? Although he's content with life and he admits it, life as a peasant is good. It would be better if, right? And also in this same line, because we know that he wants this land and he thinks that it holds the key to bringing more happiness, he is impatient to get it. And we see this in the fact that he doesn't want to wait to be able to buy the land that he wants. He wants to be able to buy it up front. 
because he sees the land being bought up around him. And so he goes into this grand scheme of, one, borrowing money from people, selling off portions of his his livelihood, mainly his livestock, right? And also putting his son essentially into servitude, right? And taking all of his wages for himself. And speaking of his family, we also see that he's abusive towards them, right? When he gets these fines from the steward in part two, he comes home and he's very nasty to his family in the way that he treats him. The text says that he is rough with his family. So we can imply that to mean verbally abusive or even physically. So uh, by all senses of the word, he doesn't seem like a very nice or a kind man, but he does have a few good characteristics going for him. And one that we see is the fact that he is a very hard worker. So he earns enough money to pay his debts, right? So although he does go into debt, he pays it off very quickly. He's a good farmer. We see that in the fact that his crops yield in their very first harvest, and he's a go-getter, right? He sees this opportunity to have more land, and he takes it, he seizes it. But in the same time, as we draw these conclusions about Pockham, we're not just drawing them to say, okay, I understand him as a character. In a sense, we're kind of acting like a psychologist. So we're looking at his actions and his thought process, and we're looking at things in his behavior that are contradictory. And we see three main ones here that pop up, we need to make note of them because we're going to see other contradictions unfold as the story does. And one is that although he believes that peasants are free from temptation, right? He agrees with his wife that we don't fall into the traps of city life. In the very same portion of the text, he falls temp in, under temptation, right? To the key tempter himself the devil, right? So this contradiction, right? Another one, he states in the text that he resents these landowners, right? Particularly for the fines that they impose on poor peasants like himself. But before the text, right, is even done, he has become what he formerly resented. Right? He becomes a landowner. And then finally, although we see that he worries about being able to pay these fines, he becomes so stressed out that he takes it out on his very own family, he is willing, without so much as the blink of an eye, to go into severe debt just to buy land. Right? So we begin to see these contradictions existing in Pockham, and these contradictions exist because we're talking about realist literature. And just as you and I, as people, are complex, we do things that are sometimes contradictory to our own character, to our own nature. Right? Pockham is the same. And that's one of the beauties of realist literature, that we can better identify with Pockham and his struggles, because in some senses, he reflects certain aspects of ourselves as humans also. That's going to be it for our discussion of the first part of how much land does a man need. So for your homework, I would like you to read sections three and four. They're very short. Okay? If you have your literature textbook, you can find that on page 961 to page 964. Or if you don't, don't worry, I've posted along with this assignment on Google Classroom, a PDF copy of the text. So you'll see Roman numerals at the top of each section. So one, two, three, four, just find sections three and four and only read those and take notes just in terms of comprehension and what you understand. And please make sure that you do that before you watch the video that will be uploaded for tomorrow. Thanks for watching and enjoy the reading.